thank you Lord you ministered to us by your word and through your spirit the Lord I pray every every soul to see Jesus be touched by the power of your spirit we want to give you honor we give you praise and we give you glory thank you King of glory <laughs> you are we declare this morning you are the King of glory welcome welcome thank you amen thank you Jesus God bless you thank you hallelujah it's always such a privilege and a pleasure to be together in the house amen would you turn to your neighbor and say I'm glad you're here this morning glad you're here come on say it say it you know say it like you like you're glad amen come on I'm glad you're here this morning all those that are visiting and and come for the first time we're glad you're here this morning some of you that have come back after being away a while we're glad you're here this morning amen you see the body of Christ is a family it's an army and all those other uh, things but the essence of God is relationship the very purpose of God in his dual purpose mandate of Christ was to re-establish relationship with mankind. And we spoke last night how Jesus came and died and destroyed the works of sin and death, rose from that place of Hades or hell, and he ascended to the Father. And the whole of earth, all those that had died and gone into, into Hades as it were before Jesus was risen from the dead, rose with him and they stood at the gates of heaven. Well, open up your gates. Amen? Open up your gates. Come on church. Amen. They cried in, in such celebration. Open up your gates and let the king of glory come on in died on the cross <clears throat> Jesus Christ the Messiah he rose as Christ Jesus the triumphant and he entered heaven as the king of glory there was a transition between the cross the grave and the glory and God today wants you and I as the church of God to understand the transition that he's doing in our lives as well. From the cross to the grave to the glory. Our cross is when we get born again. Our grave is when we get water baptized and we put off the old man and we change and renew our mind and we put on the new mind of Christ. And then we ascend to be seated in the, uh, with Christ in heavenly places and we take on the glory of God. Amen. The same transition that happened to Jesus is appropriated for us. Can you say amen somebody? Today we celebrate the most significant day in the Christian calendar. Now I'm not going to get into debate with you. See, I can debate with the, the sharks are better than the stormers or better than the blues because there's a lot of subjectivity in that debate. But in this truth, there's no debate. The most significant day in the calendar of the restoration of the church was this day the day of Pentecost but most people and I've been sharing with you this weekend about the subnormality of church culture versus the reality of kingdom culture and I haven't heard many people many ministries and many ministries preach about the significant day 
of the church was the day of Pentecost. Most will celebrate Easter, the death of Jesus. Now, folks, that's important and it's right up there. But I want to tell you on the day of Pentecost, God did something that fulfilled the mandate that God gave Jesus. If you remember from Friday, we spoke about kingdom and we spoke about Adam, who was God's governor on the earth. Now, you see, all of us have heard all of this, but in different flows or different contexts and certainly different constructs. What I want to do over these three days that we've been here, and thank you for receiving us. Again, I just want to honor Pastor Jacques and his wife for just being such gracious hosts and the leadership of this fellowship for just receiving us. I want to say speculatively, because I can't say affirmatively because I'm not Jacques, he might have been a little nervous for me coming. Not because he was fearful, but because he loves you so much. He protects you and he protects this holy ground. Amen? So he checked me out. I'm sure he did. <laughs> but I thank God for the reception. And it's an honor to stand here this morning before you. I'm humbled to be his servant. And to be able to minister to you the loving word of God. I honor the team that's ministering with us. And my wife especially. Darling I love you. We need to honor each other more. Amen. We need to honor each other more. Amen. We need to honor each other more. Amen. Are you kidding me? Hallelujah. See, I don't know who taught you to be silent in church. This is a time of celebration. This is a time of the glory of God. Amen. Now, I'm not saying be disruptive and be noisy. But there's times when we should jump up and shout, Amen, Hallelujah. If you go to some of the, some of the churches in Southern America, Southern America, South America, not America, the USA, they take out their handkerchiefs. And when you're preaching and, and they're getting excited with the word, they start waving their handkerchiefs around. <laughs> you really pray that they're clean handkerchiefs. <laughs> but you know what? We might look at that and say, oh, I'm not sure. That's just their expression of excitement. In other places, they do other things to show their excitement for what they're hearing and receiving. We need to be excited about the gospel. We need to be excited for Jesus, man. So we heard what happened in Genesis when Adam, the governor, appointed by God, he sinned and he relinquished, he gave up, he abdicated his responsibility as the governor and the governorship of God was taken out of the earth because God always moves and works through people. When I was growing up, there used to be a, a children's uh, cartoon called Casper the Friendly Ghost. Do you any, any of you remember that? Well, the Holy Ghost is not Casper. <laughs> And see, even in South Africa, even in Afrikaans, we don't use the, the term Holy Ghost. We talk about the Holy Spirit. Because yeah. we don't have, you know, the, cause we, maybe the connotation is Casper. <laughs> <laughs> but the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the earth. But Jesus came and the governorship was missing. For all those years, the enemy had rule, and he had a twofold purpose. His first purpose was to separate God's creation, man, from God. And he achieved that in the Garden of Eden. 
And through the ages, his second purpose was to establish his false kingdom authority on the earth and cause men to live under the influence of a false authority, the devil. And demonic forces, the Bible calls them principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and wickedness in high places. Amen? Those are the facts of Scripture. But when that was happening in the Garden of Eden, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are one, they decided... We will restore back to the original blueprint plan what we had planned before the foundation of the world. And so they planned how they could legally and legitimately come back to the earth to restore the twofold mandate. Number one, restore the church back to God. Number two, and we spoke on Friday about kingdoms and territories. And God wanted to reestablish the territory of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so the plan of Jesus was to come with that twofold purpose to be able in the spirit to legitimately and legally bring the church back into fellowship and right standing with God. Secondly, to re-establish God's kingdom authority on earth as it was intended to be when he said, let there be. Amen? You with me so far? Amen. And so God, through the ages, visited mankind. The Holy Spirit or the anointing was given to men and women in the Old Testament, but it was an anointing, it was Emmanuel, God with them. The anointing, and I'm going to use the word Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit on them. And all through the, the ages of the Bible, they did mighty exploits, mighty miracles. God did so much wonders and signs in the earth, but it was God with them, the anointing on them. And today we need to understand that you and I have the ability to have the anointing on us. But God did not want us to only have the anointing of God on us. Now for some people, that's, that's help me, lacquer. <laughs> but I want to tell you, if you think having the anointing of God on you is lacquer, you've only got half of it. Come on somebody. When we think that the anointing is manifest in goosebumps. Help me. What a flesh. Wunder. You see, you took away the Afrikaans Bible, but I have to preach in English. You see, we, we've been so misconstructed that that is what we long for. And we sang songs in, in the 70s and 80s that were an absolute lot of BS. Now some of you might know what BS stands for. <laughs> Let me tell you the true definition. BS stands for Biblical Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> because anything that is not of the Word of God is foolish or stupid. And we were taught through the Pentecostal age and the religious age, they sang that song. Reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. And everybody sang and there was tears and people were weeping on the floor and God was weeping in heaven. Because He's not walking around the aisles. <laughs> 
And every time we do things like that, we say the cross and Calvary and the ascension and the coronation was in vain. Yes. Yes. Come on, somebody. You might as well say amen. Or you're going to have to say amen. Amen. <laughs> Brother, next time I come back, I'll be better. <laughs> See, if I go to English churches, then I get away with just preaching in English. If I start coming to, to Afrikaans congregations, I've got to start speaking a little bit more Afrikaans. Amen? Amen. Forgive my bad interpretation and, 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 and pronunciation, but I'll get there, I promise you. So you see, we've been taught the subnormality. And we've accepted the subnormality. And even when we now talk about what happened in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, one of the most, the most significant milestones, one of the most significant events in the whole of God's restoration plan. We've watered it down. Let's not water it down. Let's fire it up. Amen. So let me, let me go back to Luke. So Jesus came and he paid the price, went, to, went down into hell, paid the price, destroyed the devil. Amen. He, and this is, another, this is another seminar that I love teaching. It's called the highest authority. And it's a biblical uh, thesis, as it were. Somebody lend me some keys. Somebody got a bunch of keys. I need a bunch of keys. It's got to be a bunch. Anyone got a bunch? Not one cocky. That'll do. That's a bunch. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. You see, when Adam, Adam had the keys of governorship. Adam had the keys of governorship. Are you with me? You okay? When the devil came and deceived Adam and Adam resigned the governorship, the keys of the governorship passed into the hands of the devil. And Jesus came. And he paid the price on the cross and he went to the grave and he paid the price in the grave not only just to redeem us. That was plan or mandate A, mandate B. He took back, the Bible says, the keys of the authority of this nation, of this territory. And he rose into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the Father with the keys of the authority over this earth. And I've got a whole teaching about seven sessions on what this meant. The keys of the kingdom. See, we, want to, we say we want to understand kingdom, but the Bible talks specifically about the keys of the kingdom. And if we don't understand what those keys are, now keys do some things. Keys lock and keys unlock. You can get to the door with the wrong key and you can't get in. So we've got to understand in the spirit the keys of the kingdom and what we can bind, what we can loose, what we can open, and what we can shut. And that whole understanding of binding and loosing in the spirit is linked directly to the keys of the kingdom. Please get the book. <laughs> the keys of the kingdom. Hanging on to the keys if you don't mind. See, once you've got the keys, you don't want to let go. When you get the keys of the kingdom, church, I want to tell you, you'll ride them out, you'll put them on your fridge, you'll put them on your door, you'll put them on your mirror. You won't want to let them go because they're in the understanding of the revelation of the Spirit of God. You've got the power. And so in the Old Testament, and by the way, the Old Covenant, there was a transition between the covenant of Moses and the covenant of the kingdom. The disciples, during the period of the Gospels, before the ascension of Christ, lived under the covenant of Moses. Even though Jesus walked with him physically on the earth, they were walking under the covenant of Moses. See, we, we were again, and it's, it's, it's a slight misalignment our New Testament starts in Matthew 1 but the New Testament actually only starts in the resurrection ascension and coronation of Jesus come on somebody 
And so in the book, in the Gospels, in the synopsis of the Gospels, you see many times Jesus said to them, and he called, let's go to Luke chapter 9 verse 1, just to show you that I'm not making this up. This doesn't come from First Imagination 6-4. <laughs> Amen? This comes from the Word of God, Matthew 9. Matthew 9 says, And he called the, the twelve disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure all diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Matthew, 10. Matthew 9. No. Luke 9, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a synopsis. I, I normally preach it out of Matthew, so I've gone to Luke this time. I'm sorry. Thank you for the correction, Pastor. She's checking me out. Praise God. So Luke 9, 1. No, no, also Luke 10. Yeah, it is. But I'm preaching from, from Luke, I'm t t preaching from Luke 9 to start. Okay, Luke 9, 1. And he called his disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach what? The kingdom. And to heal. And to heal. And to heal. Every time you leave your front door, you are anointed of God to go and preach the kingdom and heal. Yeah, come on. He sent them out. So send I you, Jesus said. So he sent them out. Now that is Old Testament. Even though it's written in the gospel, it's the, under the covenant of Moses. Are you still okay? Are you still with me? Amen? And so what was that? That was the Spirit of God on them. They carried the anointing on them. But they had all power and all authority. That's what the Bible says. And then Luke 10, same thing. I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over the powers of the enemy and nothing shall in any ways harm you. That's in Luke 10. 18. But that was Old Testament. So there was a, a outpouring, and I'm using that word carefully, don't misunderstand me. There was an outpouring of authority on the church. On the disciples. And it worked for them. Because when you look in, in Luke 10, he sent them out to minister and he gave them authority. And when they came back, what was their report? Hey, Jesus, even the devils obey us. <laughs> so we see evidence that the anointing on them was powerful. Now we fast forward. Jesus has ascended. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and he's got the keys of the kingdom. He's got the keys of authority. Now, the teaching on the highest authority, when God made man, Old Testament Adam, God made him, man, a little lower than the angels. Psalm 8. Man fell under the dominion of the devil. So if you can imagine God is level one. The angels were level two. Adam was level three. The devil was level four. When man fell, he fell below the devil. Level five. Are you with me? Are you okay with that? Because we were subject to sin and death. We were subjected to the principalities, powers, rulers, and darkness, wickedness, and our presence. So we were under that subjection. So we were lower than that. When Jesus took the keys out of the grave, took back the authority, and he rose and sat at the right hand of the Father, he wanted to reestablish his church in relationship with his Father, but he also wanted to reestablish territorial governance on the earth. The keys represent territorial governance or the administration of the governance of the kingdom. 
Jesus' coronated king. And then, remember it was part of the plan. Why did Adam fall? Why did Adam fall? Because he was a little lower than the angels. Because even in heaven, if you read your Bible and you go back to find an event, there was a group of angels that fell. So if you were a little lower than angels, you were susceptible to fall. Are you still with me, church? So the church went to level five. When Jesus, part of the plan that they had, had uh, established in the spirit was to come twofold. Number one, redeem my people back into relationship and right standing with God. And number two, to reestablish the rule and the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Part of that, God said, we cannot have the church lower than angels. Because they're going to be sub subjected to fall. So Jesus, see, I'm just joining scripture for you. So when Jesus said our identity is in Christ, our position is in heavenly places. When we are born again of the Spirit of God, we move from a level five to a level one. Hmm. -hmm. You missed a great opportunity to give God a shout. Amen. You missed a great opportunity. So you didn't catch it. I'm going to have to throw it again. Now I did promise. Normally I use water. And the minute I've got water in my hand, I'm dangerous. So I promise not to use water. Because I believe in full immersion, not sprinkling. <laughs> Toby's getting nervous on the front. <laughs> you see, church, if you understand the highest authority, God moved us from a level five that was under the subjection of the devil and the demon forces, and He didn't just move us back to where Adam was, He lifted us a notch higher above angels so that we are in Christ. Amen. In heavenly places. Amen. You're not just saved. You're raised up with him to sit in heavenly places. And at his coronation, he set that and established that into spiritual law. Remember we said that the king makes declarations and statutes and the ter territory and the people in the territory obey the statutes of, of the king. So King Jesus, in one of his first executive orders when a king makes a decree his first decree was I've elevated my church that's been reconciled back to my dad I've lifted them up to sit with me in heavenly places above the Bible says principalities and powers The earth was restored kingdom of God. The earth, from the day Jesus rose and was coronated, and God says, I give you the earth as a kingdom. The earth was redeemed. The earth was restored as the kingdom of God on earth, in the territory of earth. But it lacked a governor. Because Adam had given away the governorship back there in Genesis. So the earth lacked a governor. There was an anointing that was poured out and sat like a mantle on various members in the body of, in, in the Israelites, in, in the church in those days. But it was a mantle that came on and it was a mantle that could be lifted. <gasps> Lend me my jacket there please, Fidu. Give me my jacket. And I watched all these preachers in the age walking around, flapping their jacket at people, catching a larger anointing. <laughs> oh. 
Now listen, I love you. And I love you enough to say this. You don't need my jacket. You need God's anointing. You don't need Elijah's anointing. You need God's anointing. You don't need my preaching. You need the Holy Spirit revelation. I'm running around flapping jackets. You probably do better flapping flip jo fl uh, flap jacks. And see, we got into all this hype. My jacket's a nice jacket, sorry. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And we set that up. So God promised to restore governorship. So to restore governorship, he needed a governor. God sent Jesus as part of the Godhead to earth to fulfill the mandate. Restore the body of Christ in right standing and fellowship with God and come and destroy the works of the evil one and take back the kingdom of the territory into the kingdom of God. For this purpose, 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he could save you. That's not in my Bible. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he may destroy the works of the evil one. Yes, yes. For this purpose, you see the purpose of God, the mandate of God, the assignment of Jesus was twofold. Number one, to redeem the church and bring us back into right standing with God, which we focused on and that's great and it's important. But the second part of the mandate we have not focused on because the focus of that part of the mandate was so that we can see the governorship on the earth under the power of God. So what did God do on the day of Pentecost? Now, I was just talking with your pastor this morning and spurring with him. I love to spur with people. She, in the King James and other good translations, it says when the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Most Bibles have taken the fully out. So there had to be, if it was fully come, then there was a measure of it before the day of Pentecost. And the measure of it is what they had all the way through the Old Testament. They had the anointing Emmanuel with them, God with them, the anointing upon them. But on the day of Pentecost, something changed, something beautiful happened. The power of the Spirit of God was poured out and they were baptized. They were infilled with the Holy Ghost and power. No longer do they have to rely on the Spirit of God on them, like this jacket, like a mantle, the Spirit of God on them. They now had the Spirit of God in them. And it revolutionized, it changed their life, it changed their ministry. Because just as it happened on Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the church had been persecuted by the Jews. Jesus had been cru crucified by the Sanhedrin and by the Jews. And they were assembled in Jerusalem in fear. The disciples were hiding until they saw Jesus. And he came and he spoke with him in many different times, in many infallible proofs. And he spent 40 days speaking to them about the things pertaining to the kingdom. Then on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out into the church, inside of us dwelleth the power of the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, Peter got bold. And the Jews and those assembled in Jerusalem, you know the account in the Bible, they were saying, what is this? They're, they're drunk. It's only nine, nine hours in the morning. They're drunk. What's going on? Peter went out in front of those that had been persecuting the church, uh, amongst those that were condemning the church. And Peter stood up and he preached the message from uh, Acts 2.38, this is he that you crucified. And he started preaching with boldness and power. 
And then all the way through, and then we get to Acts chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. They were going up to the synagogue to pray. They're going up to the church, filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, filled with the anointing of God. And they get to the, the pool, and there's a lame man there, and they say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee, in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, poured out at Pentecost. Rise up and walk. And miracles, signs and wonders started to happen in the, in the, at the hands of the apostles. The book of Acts is the works of the Holy Spirit through the church. Today the church needs to continue the works of the Spirit of God in every place, in every facet. So what did God do? You see, you know how, you know the best way to intimidate my enemy? Get my kids to beat him up. <laughs> Man, I got a I got a 17-year-old boy. Straight out of a trick, he became a professional cage fighter. So he's pretty tough, you know what I'm saying? My boy's still very protective over me. So when my enemy comes against me, the enemy, you know, got a little bit of pride, a little bit of arrogance. Derek doesn't fight him, the my kid fights him and beats him. <laughs> Isn't that humiliating? An adult gets beaten up by a kid. What did God say? God's got a sense of humor, see? So God said, devil, not only have I beaten you and destroyed you and taken back the power, the keys, I'm pouring out the Holy Spirit as the new governor of the territory. The Holy Spirit is the governor of the territory. He's governing. And then he took the keys of the authority that he has and he came and he indwelt us. And in us, he gave us the keys of the authority of the kingdom of God. Do you understand, church, this morning? The same Spirit, the Bible says in Romans. The very same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, dwelleth in me. And we think the Holy Spirit's a bunch of goosebumps. Come on, somebody. You might as well say amen. Or you're going to have to say amen. This is that that was spoken of by the prophet John. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Young men like me will have vision. <laughs> See, so when somebody comes to me and says, I had a dream, then I know they're thinking old. But if they have a vision, I know they're thinking young. That's just scriptural. Old men will dream dreams, young men will have vision. The trouble with dreams is if you're only dreaming and you don't materialize it, it'll stay a dream. But if you have a vision and you activate it, it'll become a reality. Church, have you got a vision for the power of God that we carry? Have you got a vision for the amount of fire that's inside your dwelling, inside your being? It's the tabernacle of the Spirit of God. Have you got a vision how God wants to pour it out of you into your community, into your family, into your workplace? Have you got a vision of that? Excuse me. Not just sitting on the couch dreaming about it. God doesn't want dreamers. God's looking for some vision. So the power of God came on the day of Pentecost. It was marked by wind and fire. Now let's not confuse that with hot air. <laughs> okay, you missed that one too. <laughs> Yesterday with the men, 
I asked one brother to come a little closer to the fire. Because you see, the fire of God will do two things. It will purify us or it will burn us. God wants the fire that's in us to purify us. But he wants the fire of God in us to burn away the sin of the world. Destroy the works of the devil. For this purpose was the church made in the likeness and image of God. Jesus said, the works that I do, greater works shall you do than these. Not just because he was going to the heavens and sit with the Father to sit down and take a break because he'd finished his work. His work was finished when his mandate was fulfilled. And his mandate was fulfilled. Now, stay with me. His mandate was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when the governor was restored as the governor over the territory of the earth. It's so important to God. It's so important to God. He didn't leave governorship solely in the hands of man, even though he now had a redeemed man that was in his likeness and image in the right hand, sitting at the right hand of the Father. He saw the governorship over this territory so, so critical, so vital and so important that his Holy Spirit came to be the governor. You know, if, you ever, if you've got a big corporate, a big company, and the CEO and the COO show up you must know they're serious about it. Amen? They don't delegate it. Well, if I put it into secular terms, the Holy Spirit, I'm just giving you an example, this is not the Holy Spirit. Please don't throw me with shoes or bricks. But the Holy Spirit's like the chief operating officer. He runs the business of the governance of God on the territory of the earth. Hmm. Is this okay, church? So why can we be the light and the salt? Why can we be the fragrance of Christ in every place? Because we carry in us the governor, the Holy Spirit. We carry in us the power of God. The glory of God. The anointing of God. He's no longer just on us. He's in us. And that's why he called you a minister in the marketplace. Let me just give you something quick. Because I know we're running out of time. Although the lady set a good precedent yesterday. They had church all day. <laughs> Thanks for that guys. You see, when we understand restoration, all the way through the ages, God was restoring truth to the church. And what God has done in the last 200 years has been restoring truth about ministry. As I said, there's fivefold ministry, those that are in, in the work of, of God as pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and apostles. And then there's marketplace ministers that are ministers of the gospel, but situated in a marketplace environment, but all ministers. Why? Because God says, I'm making you the priesthood of all believers. Wasn't the priesthood of the clergy, the Germanies? It's the priesthood of all believers. Revelation says we're kings and priests. Why are we kings and priests? Well, number one, we're priests because he said the priesthood of all believers. Why are we kings? Because our identity is in Christ, the King. See, I've heard some weird teaching on that too. <laughs> By the way, false advertising. Steers have Wacky Wednesday. I think the church invented Wacky Wednesday long before Steers. With some of the teaching that was put out. <laughs> and we swallowed it, line, hook, line, and sinker. But if you look at the restoration of the current days, the current dispensation of time that we're in, 
God started to restore in the probably 1930s, almost 100 years from before now. He started to restore the office of the evangelist, the mantle of the evangelist. And we saw great revivals taking place. The Welsh revival, the, the Azusa Street revivals and things like that were really prominent in those days. And revivalists were seen across the world. And then we had tele-evangelists and the gospel was being preached and promoted across the world and more people and more people were starting to see and receive the power of God, the kingdom of God because the media was getting it out there. And after God has restored the evangelist, he started to restore the pastoral ministry. And he started over the period, restored the pastors, then he restored teachers. And in the 80s, we had great Bible teachers that taught on healing, taught on faith, taught on a whole lot of subjects, and they became core specialists. They only preached on those things. They only preached on the subject that God had given them because they had an assignment to reestablish those truths in the body of Christ. Then God now had a church that was evangelized and saved, pastored and cared for, taught and equipped. Then he restored the, the mantles of prophets so they could hear the voice of God and start giving direction to the church prophetically. And once he would got the prophetic restoration flowing. He started to restore the, the mantle of the apostles. Those who govern the administration of the kingdom of God and pass that administrative understanding to the church. Why did he do all of that? So that Ephesians 4 could be fulfilled. He restored those mantles of the fivefold ministry so the fivefold ministry could start equipping the saints so the saints could do the works of the ministry. <laughs> See, up until then there was a problem in the church, and I'm generalizing, the general church had a problem. Nobody was doing the works of the ministry. They thought the pastor had to do it all. And if you remember in a certain time frame, there was a dispensation that if you bought a new car, you must call the pastor and he'll come and pray and anoint your car. And it gave rise, and I'm not going to talk about this this morning, that's a whole other series for me. It gave rise to what I've termed the high and holy man. The important one man figure on the pulpit. That was never God's intention. God's intention all the way through Scripture is the plurality of ministry. The priesthood of all believers. And God was restoring all of that so that the church, the body of Christ, the, the fivefold ministers and the marketplace ministers together could go out into the territory under the governance of the governor and administer the kingdom. You and me. And every other born again believer across the world. And that's what this is all about today. Baptize. He said, I'll baptize you with fire. Yesterday with the men. I asked my brother on behalf of the men to do a prophetic act and take a log off the pile. And we prayed and we dedicated that log as us going into the fire of God that we catch fire. And we started burning. My brothers, I know you probably do bry flesh quite often. Amen. Well done. I do too. So I want you to remember this every time you light a bry. Take a piece of wood. Make this prophetic statement declaration. Lord, this is me. I'm coming to your fire to be ignited. Amen. Amen. Ladies, get in there too. <laughs> I'm coming to your fire, Lord, to be ignited. If I had to call you something this morning as the church, I'd like to call you a furnace. Because inside of us burns a fire of the Holy Ghost. What happens when you open the doors of a furnace? The heat of the fire. And my brother yesterday, he got, I put him close, now, I don't know what happens. You guys live in the low field. You're used to heat. 
I'm a Sochi, I come from the cold. Actually, you are a Sochi. <laughs> Brother, I was born there, but I was born again. I'm now a king. I'm a creation of the king. And I put him near the fire, and he wanted to step back. You guys should be used to the heat. So what I'm saying to you is like this alabaster box. When you open it, the oil of God, the power of God should just flow out. Paul said it so beautifully in Romans 1.11. They were inviting him to come and minister. And Paul said this in Romans 1.11. I long to come to you that I may impart to you spiritual gifts that you be established. How many know what those spiritual gifts are? Can anyone name those nine spiritual gifts? What are the nine gifts of the Spirit? Not the fruit. The fruit of what we produce out of our character and understanding with God. Amen? The fruit is what we're producing. An arrow tree produces arrows. Okay? But what are the, what, what are the gifts of the Spirit? Does anyone, can anyone name them for me quickly? Yes, one, two, word of wisdom, three, tongues, language, faith, working of miracles. Those are the gifts of the Spirit. They're not ours, they're His. What was Paul saying? I long to come to you, Toby, so that I can open up and pour out the gifts that are in me of the Spirit to you. That you may be established. Not so that I can get prominence. There's too many preachers wanting to give something away to get prominence. I don't want to get no prominence. I want to pour out the oil. Or open the doors and the furnace, the heat of the furnace. Make sure, wow, what's that guy got? Come on, somebody. Forgive me for saying it like this. Peter walked in the streets with the power of the Holy Spirit and he was able to take a handkerchief and they laid it on the sick and the sick got healed. Amen? I want to say it a little differently in the 21st century. The power of God as we walk in the anointing of Pentecost, the fire of God that is in us starts to burn away sin in our community Amen. thank you for two heads that nodded fortunately they went up and down and not sideways <laughs> church did you hear what I just said the power of God the fire of God in us starts to burn away the sin in our community when I was quite a lot younger as a young minister, I used to take some of our youth that were spiritual and mature. And we'd know where the parties are. <laughs> and we'd go to the parties. Now before you say sis on you, sin on you, shame on you, pastor. We'd go to the parties and we'd infiltrate the parties. And we'd, see, I understand the position of guarding. And we'd strategically spread out and be all over the, the, the room or, or where the venue was. And we'd be praying in the spirit. And then we'd go sit next to somebody and just sit there and speak in tongues and pray. Ask the fire of God to come and burn away the sin. Guess what happened to the party? <laughs> just died. Nine o'clock, people going home. We killed the party. We didn't jump up and try and grab a pulpit and preach. We just brought the presence of God into the party. And he became the party pooper. <laughs> and we'd see young girls in the meeting and just go sit near them and pray protection of the blood over them that they would not be uh, hurt and, and brutalized as young women. And they go home. And I'm going to tell you some of those young girls we saw in church later on in their lives. And you know, it's, it's just amazing how you remember a face. 
And you say to them, you know, do you remember about three years ago you were at a party and that party failed? Today you're in church and you've got your hands lifted to God. Amen. The Holy Spirit was drawing you away from sin into the knowledge of salvation. Now church, if you want to dress up like mommy and they call you father, and you go into a place like that, you're not going to be effective. You're just going to be aggressive. But you see, we need to learn as the church to be in every place. The Bible says we are the fragrance of Christ in every place. So when you go to work tomorrow morning, be fragrant for Christ. Amen. You see, perfume doesn't open and do, do a dance on the table and sing and shout and scream. Perfume, you take the lid off and it infuses the atmosphere. When you and I go into a meeting, into an office block or, or a shopping center, Lord, I want to infuse this place with the glory of God. And watch people. <coughs> now, I'm a little naughtier than you. I was sitting with some pastors, been preaching in, the, in their city for a weekend like this. And before I left on the Monday morning to go back to my place, we decided to all meet for breakfast. And we're in a restaurant having breakfast. Just four of us sitting at a table, four guys talking about Jesus. And a man and a woman came into the restaurant and sat at a table just near us. And they sat on the corner. They didn't sit opposite each other. They sat on the corner. That immediately talks to me as a little more intimate. And while we're talking, the Holy Spirit said to me, go sit at that table. Excuse me, guys. Bless you. I'll be back. And I went and I just pulled out the chair, sat at the table. I said to the man, Sir, this woman that you're with is not your wife. Go home to your wife. <laughs> Boom. I went back to my table. <laughs> Carried on with my breakfast. Why? Because as an instrument of the Holy Spirit, He positioned me there to protect a marriage. I don't know who that couple is. I've never met that couple. I'm longing one day to meet them. Or him and the, his wife and her and her husband. It's going to be a great conversation. <laughs> Church, if we understand what God has done by bringing the governor, the Holy Spirit, and establishing him not just on the earth, fluttering around like Casper, but living in you and I, the power of God unto salvation, the power of God with signs, wonders, fire, and miracles, you can't sit still. Can you imagine trying to preach this sitting down? <laughs> you can't. Why? Because the Spirit of God, the Bible says, you know, Zerubbabel in the Bible, it said the Spirit of God churned, stirred Zerubbabel. When last did you ask the Holy Spirit to stir in you? Oh, I just go, I'm saved. I got the Holy Ghost and goosebumps. <laughs> The Holy Ghost ain't goosebumps. The Holy Ghost is fire. First thing he wants to do, church, he wants to burn away the dross, the wood, hay, and stubble in our lives so that we can be pure vessels unto him. Man, you're not the fire department. You're the spiritual arsonist. <laughs> Setting fire to sin. By the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yeah. And you see, they can't blame me. Because it wasn't me, see. It was the Holy Spirit. I didn't do it. It was He in me, the hope of glory. See how we change our language and our thinking in kingdom culture? We're not born again filled with the Spirit of God just to talk in tongues. 
Thank God we talk in tongues. Paul said, I thank God I talk in tongues more than you all. But his purpose wasn't to talk in tongues. His purpose was to do what Jesus told him to do and continue the mandate of destroying the works of the evil one. Making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Join those two scriptures together, church. Are you still okay with me? No. Now you know all of this. You're a fantastic people. You know this. I just came to sew that material with this pattern into a different cloth. Amen? <sighs> Some people made it a prayer shawl. I made it a khaki. <laughs> Guys, do you hear what I'm saying? Why don't you close your eyes? Just so you're not distracted by me or others. Why don't you ask the Holy Spirit right now? Why don't you say this with me? Father, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry that I was just carrying you around and not allowing you to be released. From today, Lord, I want you to be released out of my life. I want your fire, the consuming fire of the Holy Spirit, to touch lives, to burn away sin, and show forth the glory of God. I'm your instrument, Lord, and I commit today to be that instrument. I'm willing to sacrifice and lay down my all so that you can flow and be your own. I thank you this morning for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. I receive now the spirit of power, the spirit of fire, the governorship of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. And amen. All right. Well, I thank you. You've been so gracious as I've given you an introduction to this morning's message. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah>. Sorry, Pastor. <laughs>